Uh, apologies for that. My QuickTime player is acting kind of funky. Um, it stopped recording, and honestly, I didn't. I don't <laughs> have time to to start it all over again. So I'm just going to make the rest of it hopefully in a second video. So you know, I I, I left off talking about Cherokee. You know, obviously, there's definitely the personal identity factor. There's a genuine interest factor in there. Um, Size notoriety, um, not so much the size anymore, um, because unfortunately the Cherokee have been, for the most part, been um, forced off their homelands, and their language has been disappearing. But definitely notoriety in the fact that it's perhaps the most well-known, um, you know, Native American group in Northern America. Um, yeah, and and another um, another quick thing about regional regional re representation. So um, another kind of sub region that I'm trying to represent here is the Eastern Woodlands, um, which is a you know part of Northern America. Um, but Eastern Woodlands is my main focus in Northern America, just because it happens to be happens to be where I'm from, basically, and in particular the Iroquoian family which is my top one of my top uh, two families that I'm um, that I have on my list um, because yeah mostly because of the uh, personal identity factor and the de and also the genuine interest factor unfortunately not so much the size um, and as far as being underrated and project worthy Cherokee's uh, uh, it's definitely project worthy. Just for the fact that it's in this list, it's project worthy uh, for me as well. So, because obviously I feel strongly about it, um, having part Cherokee ancestry. All right, moving to the next one, Mandingo in Africa, in West Africa. So, Mandingo um, fulfills a number of factors. Um, the regional representation, uh, you know, it definitely represents, it's definitely one of the biggest languages of Sub-Saharan Africa. Well, it represents, you know, West Africa pretty well -y. Pretty, sorry, well, that's not a word, well -y. Pretty, pretty well, sorry. Um, and personal identity, um, well, okay, so I'm, I also have African ancestry, um, mostly West African. But I don't know yet exactly which different tribes or groups or nations that uh, they my ancestry composes of. So I kind of adopted um, Mandingo and by extension the Mande languages of West Africa to be kind of an adopted a heritage language, so to speak. Um, the reason, well, you know, one of the main reasons is genuine interest. I find them very interesting languages. Um, also the size and notoriety, um, uh, especially Mandingo, obviously it's one of the biggest, uh, languages of West Africa. Not a lot of people know it. There's around 40 million speakers. Um, and, uh, oh, sorry, let me just quick highlight the description for Cherokee so you can read it real quick. Forgot to do that. Okay, there you go. Jaligi Gawon Ihisti is what it's known by. Alright, sorry, back to Mandingo. So, yeah, um, it has 40 million speakers. So, it's definitely, um, it definitely um, satisfies the uh, size uh, requirement or factor. Mandinka. Um, notoriety is pretty well known of, you know, Mandingo is pretty well known name. Um, and I and I actually do feel that it is underrated, uh, mostly because of its size and its notoriety, but at the same time there doesn't seem to be as much resources for this language as a language of this um, size should deserve in my opinion so 
it pretty much fulfills all of the uh, requirements or all of the factors which is why it's in um, the C list so I wanted to have at least one African and one uh, Native American language in this C list and those two are the ones um, alright going down to the B list intermediate so we got number four is Yucatec Maya or Maya Tan. Um, all right, Yucatec Maya regional representation. It's definitely my top language of Mesoamerica or Middle America. Um, let's see, it's one of the biggest of the region, almost a million speakers. Uh, I'm sorry. The first, before I get into that, I'll say uh, as far as um, you know, that obviously fits the. America's Africa focus um, personal identity not really just by extension of being an it being native a Native American language and me also you know having uh, Native American ancestry although from a different uh, group of people far away so it partially fulfills the personal identity factor genuine interest definitely um, I always had a keen interest uh, for the Mayan languages Partly because of their size and notoriety, for one. Um, this, um, you could take Maya, definitely fits the size uh, uh, factor. Um, it's one of the biggest uh, Native American languages, about a million speakers. Um, and it covers a pretty large region. Um, notoriety, um, yeah, that probably so as well. It was in uh, the movie Apocalypto, um, which another thing I forgot to mention that, well, actually I mentioned this on the uh, on another video about uh, the, my languages for this year, my schedule for this year. But I'll just uh, leave it at that. You know, it's its size. It's you know one of the biggest of uh, well-known languages of the Americas. Um, uh, as far as it being underrated or project worthy, you know, I honestly feel that. I mean, of course, all these languages are underrated to a degree. You know, um, you know, languages of the Americas and Africa. But within that group, I don't feel Yucatec is the most underrated one or project worthy one. I mean, there's unfortunately there's a lot of people that are working on Yucatec Maya already, and it enjoys a lot of. Um, uh, in a lot of um, like a way, a lot of people are working on it and devoting projects to it. So I don't feel it's a num a really number one as a priority contender for you know doing projects on as far as me doing it. Um, not that I wouldn't, but it's not it's not a priority as far in that regard. So a combination of all those reasons is why it's in the B group. All right. And uh, there is little description. Going further down, we have Embera, or Embera, um, of South America, which I was talking about earlier. Um, uh, let's see, doesn't seem to want to focus that well. Uh, well, anyway, Embera, um, you know, it definitely fits the uh as far as regional representation it's kind of my uh it's kind of my token uh, south american language my main south american language and also my main uh, language of the uh, ismo colombian region which is a cultural region kind of like the eastern woodlands in mesoamerica um and i actually happen to be kind of interested in this region ismo of ismo colombia for genuine interest and also the fact of it that I believe it's underrated um, alright so as far as Mbera uh, yeah uh, as far as yeah, yeah definitely fits Afri America's Africa focus oh the America's focus um, personal identity you know there's really not much of a personal connection there um, you know like as as kind of like the same as there was a personal connection with Yucatec was just an extension of you know being me being 
of having Native American ancestry, but from a different, you know, group of people. Um, the only person, the strong, the other personal connection I could think of is the fact that um, uh, my brother, my brother, my little brother, his mom is from Panama, so I kind of have it in that sense. I kind of have a connection to the region. Um, but personal identity, it's not a the biggest factor. Uh, probably the biggest factor, or one of the two biggest factors, is genuine interest. I just really like the language, um, you know, phonology-wise. It's probably my favorite in the in South America, or probably my favorite period south of uh, Northern America. Um, I really like how it sounds, uh, the phonemes. It's just really cool, and the area it's spoken in, I'm really interested in, which I'll get more into depth in a separate video. Um, so yeah, I have a high, that's one of the main factors, is the genuine interest part. The size and notoriety, um, in Berra, uh, it's not that big. Um, it should, I should note, I should mention here that in Berra is a, not, it's one language but a dialect continuum which so it's you know group of related languages and at each end of the continuum you know they're that's where they are the most different I'd say the I say the group of you know better languages share is kind of similar to the romance languages as far as you know how different they are um, more or less but my focus in Embera is going to be the northern variant or the lowland variant well the nor the lowland sub variant of the northern variant which is the biggest group the northern Embera has 140,000 speakers more or less and the lowland group or the what they call the river dweller group has about 100,000 so it's definitely the biggest variant and uh, it's to me it's the most interesting one as well um, as far as um, so yeah, that variant is in this northern area. Part of it goes into Panama. As far as uh, so yeah, size it's you know not the biggest, but it's actually it's not small either for the region. Honestly, um, it's kind of on the scale with other languages like Guaymi and Mosquito and Garifuna. But it's just not well known about is the thing. It's notoriety isn't isn't as strong. Um, but it's not that small. It's you know it's not really big, but it's not that small either for the for the region that is. Um, and then the other biggest re reason for me having it in this list is it's I feel that it's underrated because like I said, it is quite big, but it doesn't seem to get the atten attention it deserves and it's and and then um connect and as a result i believe it's very project worthy also because there isn't a lot of there isn't a lot of uh documentation out there there's a few but not a lot there should be a lot more of embera and the different um variants of embera all right uh, going on to the next one, Mende. All right, Mende. Mende fulfills um, definitely the reason. Well, okay. You know, regional representation um, yeah, compared to Mandingo really doesn't fulfill that requirement because you know, Mandingo's almost in the same area. Um, you know, obviously it fits the Africa focus. Um, and it also fits the Mande focus, which is one of my top two families, the other one being Iroquoian. Um, so in each of these families, I have three languages from one of these three groups. And Mende is the second one from Mande group, um, from the Mande group, happens to be the second biggest. Uh, you know, personal identity, just kind of how, the same reason I, I said for Mandingo, by extension kind of. Um, being a Mande language, um, genuine interest is probably the strong one of the stronger reasons that is very interesting uh, and um, 
you know, I just have a lot of genuine interest in it. Um, you know, probably more than Mandingo, at least uh, f phonology wise. I found the, you know, the, it sounds a little, you know, I think um, it has a little bit more interesting phonology than Mandingo. But what it lacks, but, but it uh, lacks in uh, size and notoriety for the region, that is. You know, there's almost 3 million speakers. Um, but for, for this region, that's not a very big language. And the region that it covers, uh, Sierra Leone and... Uh, southeastern Sierra Leone and the far western part of Liberia. It's not um, a big region, but a very interesting region nonetheless. Um, notoriety, kind of, not really well known that that much. Um, but like I said, uh, the genuine interest is strong, and then uh, you know the fact that it's another Mande language. Um, let's see, I do feel it's a bit over underrated and definitely project worthy um, because most of the good, you know, Mende uh, linguistic works came out like in the 60s and 70s and I have yet to see any ones uh, currently um, to that standard of those. So I definitely believe it needs, um, it's project worthy. Uh, hence, you know, will be another focus on, uh, it'll be a focus, a priority focus for my projects along with Embera in this particular uh, list. Um, yeah, let me show it again. Yeah, I'm sorry about uh, the map. It's not, it's pretty blurry. It's not really zooming in that well. Um, there's other varieties or, you know, uh, you could argue language is part of the continuum that includes in that includes Mende that I'm going to touch on to some extent, but I won't get into that in this video. All right, next, going back to the Americas, we have Mohawk in this region. Uh, Mohawk, you know, obviously regional representation. It's a, uh, it's kind of. Um, fits that even though Cherokee is also in the same region but you could argue that Mohawk's in a bit different region a little more to the north um, you know obviously the America's focus personal identity it you know it's a little bit stronger than say you could take Armbera just because Mohawk for one it's in North America in the eastern woodlands and two it's a relative of Cherokee in the same family Iroquoian so it's kind of like how Mende was to Man the Mende family, um, Mohawk is to the Iroquoian family um, on my list. So, uh, so yeah, there's that personal identity factor there. Not as strong, obviously, as Cherokee, but it's definitely still there. Um, genuine interest, uh, yeah, it is a uh, very interesting language. I do have a lot of genuine interest in it. Um, you know, Maybe not as much as Cherokee, but close. Um, size, notoriety, uh, it used to be a lot bigger. Um, it has more notoriety, I'd say. The fact that, you know, the, every, pretty much everyone knows about the Mohawk and the uh, Iroquois League, in which, which they were a part of. Um, so it has that notoriety going for it. Um, underrated or project worthy? I, you know, of course, like I said, all these languages are underrated, but, you know, for a language of this region, I wouldn't say it's that underrated or project worthy, at least for, from me, because I feel that kind of as the case was with Yucatec, that there's actually a lot of people working on Mohawk and they're doing a great job with it, you know, in different projects uh, involving, you know, teaching the Mohawk language and revitalizing it. So for that reason, I wouldn't, I don't take it as a focus. I'm not going to make it a priority focus as far as linguistic projects. All right, the next, right next door, we have a Huron, um, uh, or also known as Wandat. So Huron's also Iroquoian. Um, as far as regional representation, it's a bit redundant. 
at the side, you know, on the side of Mohawk. Um, but yeah, it does fit. You know, it's the personal identity wise. You know, just as Mohawk was, it's Iroquoian, so it's related to Cherokee, and it's in the Eastern Woodlands. So that fits kind of the personal identity factor. Um, and actually, general interest, uh, Wandad actually, even though it's in the uh, the A2 group, it's probably my favorite. Uh, I probably have the most actual genuine interest in it as far as uh, compared to the other two uh, Iroquoian languages. I have more genuine interest in Wandat or Huron than the other two. Um, but the the reason one of the other reasons why or probably the main reason why it's down here in this uh, list because it, it happens to be a dormant language it went the last speaker died in the 1970s and it is now being uh, revitalized um, and I luckily know some of the people that are involved in that um, but yeah so it doesn't really have uh, any speakers yet um, potentially, you could have a few, but even even then, you know, it wouldn't. Size probably wouldn't ever be a big factor with uh, Huron. Notoriety, more, yeah, a little more because you know, peop a lot of people have heard of the Huron Confederacy and everything. Um, under and uh, okay, so yeah, I believe it is underrated, and I do believe it's project worthy for the simple fact that you know it's a really interesting language I'm very interested in it and you know like I said it's a sleeping language it's been revitalized so definitely project worthy so it's one of my main focuses on uh, linguistic projects will be here on alright oh, wait going down a little more uh, we have alright Tainong Garifuna um, kind of go together just because um, I might I know I said I do it in a different video but I'll just say it now I'll just sum it up quickly I'll try to at least Taino well okay so modern time Taino is being revitalized in a modern form but it's being based on uh, a language called Inieri which is actually the father also the father language of Garifuna where Garifuna comes so basically, it's very similar. Um, just using uh, Taino words where available, you know, Taino vocabulary and grammar where where it's available, then it will be used. But for the most part, it will be uh, in Yeri um, before it became Garifuna. So I'll get into more detail in another another video. But basically, it would mean um, what's kind of known as women's speech in Garifuna, which is based on the pure uh, Arawak language of Inieri um, and uh, with you know minus the uh, the phonolo phonological influence from the Bada Biafra that Garifuna has so so yeah Taino's modern Taino and Garifuna are in, on this list um, so yeah let me go over the reasons um, so Regional representation, definitely the Caribbean area. Um, obviously, the Americas, the Americas focus it fulfills. Um, personal identity, um, a little bit. Uh, I'll explain because, well, apart from it being Native American, and you know, the other reason I stated, you know, for the the other languages like Embera, the Chilcoan language, and Yucatec Maya, the Mayan language, um, you know, so there's that region, by extension, you know, it's a Native American language, but I also um, have some ancestry from Cuba, um, so that re that's kind of, you know, on Tainos historically spoken in the eastern part of Cuba, or, well, okay, the, what's called classic Taino, but, but yeah, um, so that's another reason which makes the personal identity factor bigger here than, say, uh, Yucatec, Maya, or Embera. Um, so there's that. Uh, genuine interest. Uh, yeah, there's definitely genuine interest there. Not as much as as with Embera, though, but 
it's def it's still definitely there. Um, size notoriety. Okay, so Garifu now it's about the same size as Embera, but it's probably a little bit more well known. And definitely Taino is a lot, you know, like the example I gave in the beginning of the video. It's still it's being revitalized, and there's a lot of interest in it. Um, more so than Embera, so. Uh, so yeah, definitely hasn't the notoriety, but not the size yet. Um, but I do feel that uh, it is project worthy, just by the f the simple fact, partly because of my personal identity, genuine interest. Um, I believe that it's project that it's and the fact that you know obviously it's being revitalized, which it's always exciting thing to revitalize a language. Um, so. So that for that reason, it is going to take. Um, it's going to be in my first priority of projects. Or uh, Wahiani. Uh, not probably not so Garifuna though, but we'll see. Next, going back to Africa, we have Dan, which is a mother Mande language like Mandingo and Mende. It's in. It's right here. Um, so, alright, regional representation, it is pretty redundant because it's in the very, you know, similar areas where Mandingo is. Um, definitely fits the Africa focus. Personal identity, like I said, just as the case was with, Ma with Mende, is in a, by extension of my West African ancestry and, um, and the fact that I kind of adopted the Mande group, the Mande, I guess you could call it a subfamily of the Niger Congo family. I adopted it as a kind of a heritage group. Um, but there is definitely, you know, which uh, you know came from genuine interest. So there's definitely a lot of genuine interest in Dan. Actually, out of it is the. I do have more genuine interest in Dan than I do the other two Mande languages, actually. Um, it's just the phonology is really cool, more complex, um, um, but, you know, the reason that it's, you know, here in the A2 group and not, you know, a larger one is because it's small compared to, you know, these two, especially Mandingo. It has only um, 1.6 million speakers, which doesn't make it a really big language for that region. Um, you know, not small, but you know, for that region, it's not that major. So, the size is kind of the reason, and the lack of notoriety as well is kind of the reason why it's in the A2 group. Um, but I do feel that it is it is underrated, obviously, and. It is project worthy because there isn't a lot of uh, material uh, written about it, so which leaves in an opening for uh, a lot of exciting uh, linguistic work that I could be a part of. All right, yeah, I'm probably not gonna try to zoom in anymore because this doesn't look good. <laughs> um, all right, now to this next list. Uh, a1 and A2, or A1 to A2, you, we have uh, Kiche and Kakchikel, mind language. Um, Alright, so, okay, this is kind of a bit, as far as regional representation, it's a bit redundant because Yucatec Maya is my main language of this region, um, but it does, you know, fulfill an America's focus. And it's definitely one of the biggest languages of the Americas. Almost three million people. I believe it's the biggest language of of North America, the North American continent. Um, personal identity, like I said, just as was with Yucatec, it's by extension of it being Native American. That's all. Um, genuine interest. There is a genuine interest there, you know. Um, uh, but but more than that, it's the size and notoriety of it. Like I said, it's probably the biggest language of Northern America with the almost 3 million speakers. Um, underrated project worthy? 
you know for this region I'd say no because actually there's a lot of fortunately there's a lot of good material to learn Kiche and about Kiche and it seems to be doing quite well despite the ugly history of that region so it won't be a focus of you know a main focus uh, for uh, projects next going back to Africa we have Hausa Harsha Hausa it's Afroasiatic uh, family of the Chadic branch okay so Hausa um, regional representation it does fulfill it uh, it's even though it's it's kind of in a different region of West Africa than Mandingo it's it's almost it's also spilling into Central Africa a little so I'd say it definitely fulfills that uh, obviously the Africa focus personal identity you know as an ex just as an extension of being having West African ancestry I don't know if I do have a uh, house of ancestry it's possible but I don't know um, but there's definitely a personal identity factor there, just the fact that, you know, because of my West African ancestry. Genuine interest, it is, you know, very interesting language actually. Um, but probably what it, the most thing, the most it has going for it is its size and notoriety. It has about 100 million speakers, so it's the second largest language of Sub Saharan Africa after Swahili. Um, you know, and it's spoken from, you know, northern Ghana all the way to southern Chad. It's a huge range. Um, so that's like its strongest point that it's one of the biggest African languages. Um, underrated project worthy? Actually, I, I, to a degree, I think it is. But I, although, but I won't really make it as a focus for my projects, but it is underrated, um, and project worthy, I think to an extent um, but it's not going to be uh, like one of my priority focuses then going down a little further you have Igbo of southeastern Nigeria Niger Congo family the Volta Niger branch so regional representation eh, kind of it's kind of in its own region um, obviously Africa focus Personal identity, the same. It's the same for Hausa goes for Mending for I Igbo. Um, genuine interest. Uh, I actually do find it pretty interesting, more so than Hausa. I'd say even. Um, it is very interesting language. I really like it, um, and it also has size going for it, like around thirty-five million speakers. It's a very useful, practical language too. Um, then um, as far as being underrated project worthy I believe it is project worthy um, but not as project worthy as uh, some of these other languages so for that region for that reason it's not in my top it's not in my first priority list of projects because um, uh, I'll just give an example like comparing it to Dan for example as far as uh, you know, genuine interest goes, it's almost the same with Dan. I'd say, like, it's my genuine interest with it. Um, you know, maybe a little more Dan, but the fact that Dan is, uh, you know, Mande language is kind of another reason why it's up here instead of Igbo. All right. Next, going back to the Americas, we have Guarani. Uh, the Tupian family. So, regional representation definitely. It's South America. Um, it's pretty much on the other end of the continent as Embera. So I don't say that. I won't say that Embera. It's redundant after Embera being my top South American language. But America's focus definitely personal identity. It's the same. It's just as personal identity was with Embera. You know the same reason um, it pretty much an extension just of being of having Native American ancestry genuine interest I do actually have a lot of genuine interest in Guarani I really like it a lot and another thing good th another big thing it has going for it is its size it's the second biggest Native American language of the Americas um, with around seven million speakers so the size it definitely has a size going for it too um but 
I don't feel it's as underrated or project worthy because thankfully enough actually it enjoys uh, co-official status with Spanish in Paraguay uh, although it is endangered in Brazil but um, so I do think it's project worthy to an extent but I do I just feel that comparison to others you know it didn't make the uh, you know the first priority list which is one of the reasons why it's in this list as opposed to the other one, but what I yeah I obviously obviously do really like it. If I I mean I really like all these languages to an extent. If I didn't, they wouldn't be in the list at all. But the purpose of the video is just to show why there some languages are have higher status so to speak on the list than others. Next we have uh, Tzotzil, another Mayan language. Um, so regional uh representation it's redundant especially after yucatec and quiche um you know yucatec being my main language of the region um let's see personal I oh yeah the america's focus of course personal identity you know just the same reason as for guarani or the others um genuine interest yeah, it is a really interesting language definitely uh, the size size uh, for that region it's 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 big but it's not that big uh, five hundred thousand speakers um, you know it is I believe it is underrated to an extent even though there are oh and project worthy even though there are you know it does enjoy a lot of uh, uh, a lot of um, attention you know as far as projects are concerned but it didn't make my you know top priority list as far as projects. Um, all right, and next we have back in uh, West Africa we have Gere or We, also known as Kran in Liberia. So it's Dan's southern neighbor. Um, all right, regional regional representation no because it's you know pretty much redundant after the uh, the other mandate languages. Um, Africa focus, yeah, personal identity, yeah, is the same amount of, just for the same reasons as House and Igbo, the personal identity goes. Um, genuine interest, this is probably where it's still stronger. I, I have a really genuine interest in uh, this language and crew languages in general, the Niger Congo family, um, partly because they're some of the most tonal languages of the world. Um, so there is definitely genuine interest there. Size, notoriety, not so much. There's probably seven hundred thousand speakers, or maybe more. Um, I do believe that it is underrated and project worthy, though. So, for that reason, um, it did make the list of languages in my uh, that I'm that I want to um, I want to do projects in. Um, in the first priority list of those languages it didn't make it there so yeah um all right next and next the last list we have a uh, basic big a1 you know these are languages that are you know definitely going to be a1 there's no chance of them moving up to a2 at all um so here we have quechua all right uh quechua runasimi all right, uh, regional representation definitely. Uh, America's focus definitely. Personal identity, you know the same, re the same, you know the same uh, factors go for this one as the other non-Iroquoian, non-Cherokee, Native American languages. Genuine interest, uh, honestly, not a lot. I mean, to an extent, yeah, but not as much as others. Size and notoriety, uh, although it's definitely what it has going for it, um, it's the biggest Native American language as far as numbers of speakers. There's around 15 million more or less speakers of Quechua, and it's spoken in a large region from Colombia all the way down to Argentina. Um, definitely has a notoriety as well, being the language of the Incas. Um, underrated, project worthy. You know, I, like I said, all these languages are underrated to an extent, but for the region, I'd say not. Um, project worthy, it's the same. I don't feel it's that project worthy just because, you know, 
partly due with size, there's a lot of uh, projects already being done, so I don't feel it's a priority for the, for me to um, be involved in um, projects regarding Quechua. Next, we have Swahili, which is kind of like the Quechua of Africa, so to speak, because it's the biggest language of Sub-Saharan Africa. I mean, with, honestly, with these two languages, it was really hard because, you know, these are the two biggest languages of these regions, you know, but the, fa the fact is, though, the, per the genuine interest level is, isn't as high, um, you know, so it was kind of hard, um, but... But at least they're in the A1 list. So uh, Swahili, for example, definitely regional representation. It's it's not West Africa. It's like it's pretty much my only language in this region of Africa. The I guess you could call it the Bantu region. Um, you know, it's you know, yeah, Niger Congo, the Bantu branch. Um, Africa focus definitely fulfills that personal identity. A little, actually, a little less than uh, these other languages, just because uh, there's not a big chance that I have any ancestry from Swahili-speaking people. It's not that it's impossible, but it's not as likely. So the personal identity factor goes a bit down there. Although I I do have a, a lot of in genuine interest in Swahili, a little more than I do for Quechua. Um, it is a really cool language. Um, Size notoriety also has going for it, definitely, with more than 150 million speakers in a lot of different countries. And of course, the notoriety as well. Underrated project worthy? Uh, no. Uh, I mean, yeah, like all, to an extent, obviously, but it's pretty much well, uh, it's pretty much doing, it's doing pretty well, I'd say, as far as Sub Saharan African languages go. Uh, Swahili is definitely the healthiest, and I hope it stays that way. All right, now we're going out out of uh, the my focus regions of the Americas and Africa to Asia, which you know, I guess in another life uh, I would really be all over here as far as languages, but I picked two of my favorite, I'd say, or three. Um, so we have Tamil and Malayalam. Uh, regional representation, yeah, it, it definitely represents uh, South Asia. One of um, no, obviously no Af America's Africa focus, which is why it's in this uh, group. Um, personal identity, no, not really. Um, if anything, I'd say the fact that you know they were also a colonized people, but that's about it. Um, Genuine interest, I do actually have a lot of genuine interest for Tamil and Malayalam. Um, for the language, the languages themselves and the regions they are in. It's probably one of my f favorite, if not my favorite region of Asia, of outside of, you know, the Middle East. Um, and size and notoriety definitely have that going for it. Uh, obviously not, pro you know, project worthy for me. Um, and the reason I have both here is because Tamil and Malayalam are are kind of uh, close. You know, they're not the same, but they're very close. So I just kind of lumped them together um, into one. All right, then last but not least, we have Malay or Bahasa Malayu. Oh, by the way, this isn't like as you can see, it's a Dravidian language. And this one belongs to the Austronesian family. This includes the variants of Malaysian and Indonesian. Um, yeah, so regional representation definitely Southeast Asia. Um, obviously, doesn't fit in the Americas Africa focus, which is why it's in this category. Personal identity, you know, it's probably pretty much the same as I had with uh, Tamil and Malayalam. Um, genuine interest, definitely. There's a strong genuine interest there. Um, because there had, I mean, obviously, that's the key factor why I picked these two languages was the genuine interest and also the size and notoriety, which 
this language definitely has around three three hundred million speakers. Um, but yeah, so not really project worthy though or underrated. Eh, maybe a bit. Same with this one. I I feel it is a bit underrated too for its size, but. Uh, well, yeah, okay, that uh, concludes my video then. Um, the next video I will make about uh, pretty much 2019 and, um, you know, the indigenous uh, language. It's the year of the indigenous languages, um, but I'll go over that in the next video. All right, everyone. Uh, thanks, and sorry this was so long, but I hope you enjoyed it.